Hello and welcome to today's LinkedIn Live. Thanks to everyone out there for joining us. I'm Tom Monahan, President and CEO of DeVry University. During today's digital dialogues, I'm going to be talking with my friend and colleague, Nandini Basuthakar, CEO of Procurement Leaders and Global Talent Officer of World 50. I'm excited for this conversation as we explore the concept that for higher education to achieve its full impact on society, the sector needs to see itself as a two-sided market. We serve not only students seeking knowledge and advancement, but also industries seeking talent to power growth and innovation. With Nandini's background as a leader in supply chain strategy, we're going to explore how, as a university and as a sector, we focus on developing the most important assets for companies to grow and thrive. As we all know, that asset is people. This is gonna be a great conversation and we want you to be involved. Please ask any questions that you might have for us in the chat. We'll try to answer as many as we can during the Q&A at the end, but first I'll get us going with a couple of questions for Nandini. Nandini, can I ask you to share a little bit about procurement leaders and World 50? Uh, I know, you know, they are large and incredibly influential organizations, but they're both somewhat under the radar. They are, they are incredibly well known to the people who need to know about them, uh, but uh, the, the, the rest of the world might not even understand the scale and scope of the reach of the organizations. If you could share a little bit as to what they do, how they do it, who they do it for, that would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely, Tom, happy to. So procurement leaders, let me start there. That's the world's largest and most valued uh, procurement network and intelligence platform. So we work with 750 uh, leading global companies, about 38,000 practitioners are, are involved from around the world and we help them make faster, more informed decisions and proven paths to success. I think I like to use the word today, next practice. So there isn't one proven way, but we kind of guide insights, practical tools, expert guidance and cross industry executive connection. And the idea here is that uh, procurement, we can get into that a little bit more, procurement supply chain uh, it's about maturity. Companies moving from functional excellence to cross-functional, to supplier enabled, to network enabled. So we are trying to move organizations along that transformation curve so that they can make better decisions and follow proven paths to, to success. Interestingly, both companies were founded in 2004, but uh, two years ago in July, 2019, Procurement Leaders was acquired by World 50. Uh, the founders had decided it was time to move on. And World 50 consists of private peer communities that enable CEOs and C-level executives from globally respected organizations to discover better ideas, share valuable experiences, and have courageous conversations that will make a lasting impact. So you can imagine the busiest officer level executives, Tom, uh, they trust World 50 to facilitate and collaborate conversations on, on council on topics crucial to them around leading, transforming and growing modern enterprises. So we at World 50 serve every significant enterprise leadership role. So we're, we reside in more than 27 countries on six continents and on average leaders at companies that average more than about $30, $30 billion in revenue. So our purpose is none other, we're private, uh, than to accelerate the success of its members and their organizations. And I would say, obviously, with my talent hat on, uh, we thought it was a great cultural fit because we're composed of highly curious associates who consider it a privilege to help leaders stay ahead. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, the easy way I think about these organizations is, uh, if you pick up the Wall Street Journal or Financial Times and you look at every company meriting significant coverage that day, there's nearly 100% certainty that that uh, leaders from those companies are, in, are engaged in these networks. It's an incredibly powerful platform. So uh, congratulations to you and your colleagues for building it. Um, let, let's go a little deeper into, I think, I think the world is probably paying a little bit more attention to procurement and supply chain uh, today than we all were maybe a year, year and a half ago, whether it be you know, contention at the Suez, Suez Canal or semiconductor shortages. We're all acutely aware of 
uh, how tightly knit and interdependent uh, corporate supply chains are. Can you talk a little bit about procurement and supply chain execs and what the, you know who they are and what they do? They're obviously hugely influential, but maybe a level deeper into what, I don't want to say a day in the life, but a year in the life looks yeah. like for them. Sure. So maybe, you know, maybe just at its very basic, I'll just start with, you know, in the past, procurement is really an unfortunate word. Uh, it, it's effectively the profession of of buying is, is where the original kind of, there's a lot of conversation around sales and strategy, but there hasn't been enough conversation around the buying process. And if you think about, you know, corporations around the world, organizations around the world, your university, and think about the amount of stuff you buy, you know, from pens to swag to sweatshirts or whatever. And so in the past, the idea was that if I gave you a dollar and you could, could you could purchase one bar of chocolate and, and I could buy two, I would be the more proficient procurement professional. But today, say somebody else says, actually, we're not going to even touch that stuff because, you know, it's made from cocoa beans that have, you know, a not slave free labor or, or, you know, doesn't have a reputable link, that's the more effective procurement professional. So procurement at its heart positions itself at the heart of business to be a strategic partner. I, I like to think about procurement supply chain as three variables, e ecosystem relationships, ecosystem innovation, and really value. They are trying to deliver value inside and outside the, the, the business. And what I think is really exciting about our conversation today, Tom, is that schools, colleges, and universities, with some exceptions around the world, have typically been procurement-free zones. And young talent either has a somewhat negative perception or is largely ignorant to the opportunities that this function can offer. Even myself, as I, I grew up in a sales function, as you know, we would be taught, do not avoid procurement. Actually, procurement you know, knows the competition, knows the value stream, they have a seat at the table. They're driving sustainable profit growth. They're focusing on innovation, supplier relationship management, uh, totally, you know, call all of the costs, talent, innovation, digital, sustainability, organizational models, and risk. And when you when you think about the supply chain aspect of that, most organizations today know that you know a lot of what they're trying to drive, you know. The competition isn't, when you speak to, you know, BMW, they'll be like, my competition isn't another German automaker. My competition is the supply chain. If I don't get the challenge, someone else in my supply chain will. So it's basically exactly what you're saying, which is, you know, who makes my stuff and who makes their stuff and who's my supplier, supplier, supplier. And if something negative happens in any of that ecosystem, it can ripple back with a huge impact on your own company and your customers, you know, view of you. So that's why it's a pretty exciting uh, profession to be in right now, I think, and has seen a huge uh, meteoric rise moving from a, a more of a cost, a sort of more tactical uh, uh, function, of, you know, how, how do we do this? How many are we buying and at what cost to really being a strategic value driver? It, it's interesting. I, you know, maybe just double click a little bit on, on that, strategic value driver and, and partnering with people in the supply chain to create value uh, issue. It, it's it's fascinating. You, you and I have both uh, spent a lot of time looking at corporate innovation. That's been a key thing we've worked on together. And when you really dig into sort of the market moving innovations, invariably it's great partnership with suppliers that tends to be the root cause. You can't build a device like this without innovations in electronics, battery life, screens, all of which come from weaving together an interesting network of suppliers and compelling and interesting new ways. And I think as you, as you really dig into corporate innovation, you start to see the role that corporate partners play. De uh, um I'll try to say this right because my colleagues will be uh, justifiably angry at me uh, if I if I misspeak. Uh, we are obsessively student centric, and that's really important to us. Uh, but I think a lot of universities would claim that to be true. Uh, you know, I think most universities care passionately about the success of their students. At DeVry, we see ourselves as being equally passionate about the success of our partners, corporate partners, workforce development partners, pe people who um, ultimately employ our students, ultimately create the career paths that allow our students to thrive and have impact. So we do see ourselves as 
uh, as a supplier. We see ourselves as a supplier uh, to indus uh, of industry's most critical resource, talent. And we, we're hoping maybe to learn a little bit about uh, how to be a better supplier from what you've seen great supply from the vantage point of procurement leaders, from the vantage point of supply chain leaders, uh, what they look for in great suppliers. And, and maybe I'll just start at the top. In the, in the eyes of the world's leading procurement and supply chain executives, what makes a great supplier? What do they look for when, when they when they get grade someone an A or an A plus as a supplier? What what what's on their scorecard? Yeah, no, I think it's it's great. Um, I think it's a great question, and I and I always ask each of us to think about something in our daily lives when I answer this question. You know, think about your utility provider. Yeah, what do you look? You don't even you know. I think it's. It's a really interesting thing when we think about energy and we say, you know, the average human being spends six minutes a year with their energy bill, but 98 hours on Facebook or something like this. And, and we say climate change is one of the biggest issues of our time. But in terms of, you know, what do we look for? Uh, it, what makes for a great supplier? What do, what do companies around the world say? They typically would say probably these few things. Number one, accountability and responsibility. So they're compliant. You know, obviously this differs by industry, but by and large, you know, don't add to my risk profile. Okay. I want someone who's compliant that, you know, we've got to have a clean, clear bill of health here. There's a good safety record. They're compliant with the Modern Slavery Act. They have a clear stance on corporate social responsibility. I've got a lot going on in my company. I don't need my supplier to add to my risk profile. They need to be accountable and responsible. Obviously, secondly, you have to be able to deliver on the production capabilities and up-to-date information about what you're going to supply. That's really important, up-to-date information. We've seen that during this pandemic as being hugely important. Thirdly, striving to continuously improve and actions in place that they, they care about my organization and my end customer and can actually think about continuous improvement in that regard. And that leads to your point, uh, Tom, that you're talking about, which is demonstrating innovation, supplier-enabled innovation, consumer centricity, providing an added advantage for, for both uh, shared endpoint customers. You know, a lot of times people talk about an internal and external, like, look, there's one endpoint customer who's paying here. And then open and easy communications, you know, being ethical, proactive, but if there's a disruption, you want someone to be able to tell you, hey, this is possibly not going to, this is stuck in the Suez Canal. And I, I think it's going to happen. It's going to arrive maybe three weeks late or three days later. So that open and easy com communication. So those would be, you know, five things that I would put at the top of the list that we see corporations looking for in, in terms of a, a great supply. Yeah, there's been a pretty material shift and I think a positive shift. In, in the role of the company across the past several years, as companies have begun to play a more assertive role in confronting equity and justice issues, climate change, and and um, yeah, I, I don't I don't want to uh, oversimplify history, but if you look at it, the procurement and supply chain community has been on this issue for a while, you know, because they had to start thinking about not just their own four walls, but you know factories three layers down in the supply chain, ethical sourcing, all that stuff. It, it's been, uh, they, they, they were the, they, they've been the canary in the coal mine on a lot of these issues for a while now. What, what are the organ, what are the broader lessons from, uh, if, if, if this is a two year old issue for most of the company for procurement supply chain, it goes back, you know, probably 20 years to start to think about everything from you know, governments in countries where they operate to uh, child labor, all these issues that procurement's been wrestling with for decades. What, what are the broader lessons from uh, fr fr from this journey that that uh, other functions and other executives can learn? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, Tom. I, and I think it leads back to your, uh, your question on innovation. So whilst um, innovating ideas from suppliers is not a new idea. In fact, my favorite story of all time is, you know, you'll like this. And, you know, 1915, the trustees of the Coca-Cola Bottling Association basically said, let's spend $500 and we want to go out to our suppliers 
And the brief was, we want you to create a bottle that is so iconic, even a blind person would know it's a bottle of Coke. And imagine in Terre Haute, Indiana, the root glass company received the brief and they created the iconic Coca-Cola bottle that still exists mm. today. So mm. supplier enabled innovation is not new. Corporations then got in the way of you know, IP and patents and so on. So what I think supply chain to your question has shown is that businesses are tapping into the expertise of their supplier network to bring new products around all of these, these things, digital, innovation, sustainability, um, both consumer-led products, but also how to streamline processes. And suddenly they were like, wow, I mean, usually this comes from my R&D team, but what if I could bring all of this from all of the R&D capability, not of just my own people, but hundreds and thousands of my suppliers? And my internal footprint, sustainability footprint, is only 30% of what I'm even looking at. You know, the majority is outside. And so what you'll see is even though you'll hear about supplier-enabled innovation, mm -hmm. companies being able to systemize it, accelerate, and profit from it is still very, very immature. There are very few companies who will say, I do it really, really well. Um, and so that's where, to your point, there is a real future facing kind of look at how can we implement dynamic solutions for some of the world's greatest problems. You see, you know, German chemical companies coming together to remove plastic from the sea or companies coming together to think about AI initiatives to anonymize resumes for more inclusive hiring processes, et cetera. Um, I think one of the things that you and I have a shared heritage in is really uh, having worked at companies where still 20 years later, uh, not being able to tell our, our parents what we actually do it was a sort of common denominator in the companies like uh, our, our CEB and World 50 and procurement leaders was because there's a huge hole in the market between what people can accomplish with their own teams and what you could do with an outside firm coming in and hiring them for millions of dollars. And I think that co-optition in both academia and companies in the late 1990s saying, actually guys, even if you are in the same market, you can work together to explore knowledge and research and market share without being competitive. We are seeing that at a much higher altitude and pace now in the sustainability pace. People are saying, you know, businesses have to, absolutely have to make humanity's future the cause of the present because there's a crisis. It's a, it's a huge crisis, the climate crisis. We're seeing that in classrooms, in companies, that discerning consumer wants assurances on transparency on the supply chain. Where's the stuff coming from? What's the source of origin? You know, everybody wants to do their part. I want to buy something that, you know, is is makes a difference and doesn't, you know, they want new sources of materials, corn, soya bean, forest resources, tires, you know, where are these disposable cups coming from? The list goes on. And I think in recent years, the distrust in government almost put more of an emphasis on businesses in doing the right thing for the planet going up. And you can see, you know, uh, a year ago, I remember like Reebok launching their uh, first plant-based running shoes. It's just amazing how you can see this shift in the market. And this is where uh, suppliers are basically no longer able to say, okay, give me, you know, they're basically bringing their, the, the companies are bringing their suppliers in and saying, what cool new ideas do you have to innovate upon these? Because I need to create sustainable outcome for the end consumer yeah it's funny i was uh, i was up in boston where i grew up not that long ago and of course and on, on trips home to boston on many trips i go into dunkin donuts but i particularly like to go to visit the dunkin donuts i grew up in and um yeah a, a case example is they've transformed their menu with a ton of plant-based uh products from suppliers right these are branded but they've it's a radically changed menu and and um uh and wouldn't have been possible without great collaboration up and down up and down their supply chain um i'm going to shift gears a little bit to um kind of career stuff but because i, I know a lot of people uh, myself included are, are eager to hear uh, insights around um uh what we can each do to improve and grow and accelerate our careers um i, I have 
inside scoop on you and that I have uh, I have insight into the wide variety of leaders that you've mentored, coached, and developed. If we had infinite time, I could list off all the senior executives at other companies who really matured into leaders on your watch. Um, can you talk a little bit about your toolkit for developing great leaders and maybe how it's evolved over time? Yeah, you know, how how your coaching style today might be different than 10 years ago and 10 years before that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, first of all, thank you. That's very kind and always nice to hear. Um, I don't know that it's a, necessarily a, a toolkit per se, but um, I definitely, one of the things that I think uh, I hear from people who reach out, usually when they're thinking about getting a new job and can I get some career advice, uh, you know, is what has been beneficial was that your, the, the conversation on performance was always a pleasure and not something that someone disliked. I always thought feedback was a gift, not something that you hate. And I think very early on, probably in my life or in my career, I, I think about the two concepts of marble and sand. So marble is what makes you strong. It's, you know, fundamentally, what makes Tom Monaghan unique, differentiated, and really capable is his marble. And constantly remind people, actually, this is what you're really, really great at. This is your marble. Never change that because that's your differentiator. And that makes you unique. That is your USP. And the sand, you know, instead of you like, this is your development areas and we're going to put process around your sand is like, I'm going to make you aware of these things. And it was very helpful for me. You know, I have a very circuitous brain. If, you know, I, I'm not particularly linear, for example, I can connect this to Indian art and ballet if you want me to, because I think about a lot of topics, but I had to work myself to say, okay, Nandini, sand, the tide will come in and, you know, but you need to work on three points for when you're speaking, for example. So I use a lot of that philosophy. I think what people like when they're uh, coached is that you will invest time and energy. And I think for me, it's around helping them prioritize innovation and learning, um, making sure you understand them as human beings, as people, and the kind of cultural remit they want surrounding around them and that ability to connect them to cross silo initiatives people always say hey let me introduce you to so i think i was a good connector if you, if you will and then i think as you get to know someone and you you appreciate them i think it's that uh, ability was certainly for me because you emulate the good stuff that you experienced that you that there was trust and empowering to take on to take on operational plans you know, I trust you, Tom, you know, operational plans, updates, tactical, short time. I, I trust you to run your day to day, run the business decisions. And I'm here um, for you um, for new ways of learning to accelerate the journey. Let's test and challenge with curiosity, not judgment. Let's recognize when we make mistakes and visibly take responsibility. And I think the biggest thing, I think I, I learned a lot of that from you too. And I always appreciated the 11 years we had together, which was let's emphasize progress over perfection. I think that for me, when someone knows that, you know, it's okay to share a draft and it's not, it's, it doesn't have to be perfect. Let's emphasize pro. Those would be some of the things I'm i I'm a big believer of um, the four T model. So tell, teach, trust, and tenacity. So I like to, tell a story. I like to draw out and teach um, the teaching points. I like to build trust and that allows you to be tenacious. And I found neither of none of those can be by themselves. If there's someone who just tells good stories, you're like, mm, so, so what? If they're always teaching, you're like, okay, this is very academic. I'm not sure it's going to work in practice. Um, and you don't have the right. If you're just tenacious, you're like, okay, I mean, don't tell me anymore. I, I get it. Um, so I think those have to, to to work in tandem, if you will. That that's probably what I would say in in in, in looking back. Great, thank you. Uh, one last question, then we'll turn turn to the group. We've got a, a couple of good questions coming up. But uh, uh, you're not only uh, CEO of PL and SL, you're also global talent officer for the whole World Fifty organization. One project we have underway at uh, Devry is 
we, we took a look back at the, 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 we looked at the old Harvard classics uh, exercise of putting together a bookshelf of everything you'd need to know. Um, and, and we, it's obviously horribly out of date, but we're thinking about you know, how do we populate a, a five foot shelf of things someone should know for the digital era. And as just broadly, as, as you think about evaluating talent, hiring talent, promoting talent, what are the, what are the skills you most look for today? Skills, capabilities, attributes, whatever. What, 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 what's your, what's your must-have list? Intellectual curiosity, some demonstration of mastery in anything. Just be proud of something you've done and you, where you feel you've had impact. Impact is a really important word for me. Mm -hmm. um, contribution has the ability to role model something to fellow associates um, in the future would be an example to would be recruits, would be sought out by others. So this through, probably through case-based uh, would garner widespread spread, uh, congratulations on day of hire or day of promotion or day of whatever we insert. I think also just um, innately authentic and just in, in, in who they are. This is who I am. So, you know, when you ask the first question, Tom, and, 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 you, and when, when you meet someone, you say, look, the resume is the resume. It's, it's you know, it's either on LinkedIn or it's in black and white, but tell me who you are and, you know, et cetera. That ability for that, you know, this is who I am. This is where I'm from. This is what I've done. You know, this is where I'm hoping to go. I think there's so much in, in some of those, you know, I think it's less today because I think it's, 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 Definitely, as we look to leadership in the future, it's definitely a much more, it's very different to the kind of Crotonville model. It's around a human, you know, are they going to be able to work with diverse uh, thinkers? Are they are they going to be, you know, inclusive in their approach? Do they collaborate? You know, as we think about returning to office spaces, I, I think about, you know, a space, are, are there people who will collaborate, who will co-create, who will also say, hey, I need to isolate now because I need to get some work done differently, you know? So... Those are some of the things that we think about um, when we when we look to talent for the future. I love I love curiosity as the first because uh, that that is just such a wellspring of good stuff happening. There's a question from Daniel that who asks how can an MBA in logistics help me grow as a future professional? And maybe I'll broaden that too to say how how do you think about um, you know, obviously. De DeVry has uh, a graduate program in global supply chain management, so I'm, I'm happy to turn this into an advertisement. <laughs> but but I'd love to hear about you know kind of how education factors in and you know educational logistics or other disciplines factor into you know the most important professionals and influential professionals you've seen. Yeah, so I mean, absolutely. So with a background in logistics, you know, those would be today, what, what typically happens in large organizations in supply chain or procurement, you would enter in into what would be sort of what has previously been known as category management. Mm -hmm. So you think, you know, logistics itself, think about logistics in an organization, it's a huge category to manage, like, when a ship's coming, or, you know, all sorts, it's a huge category, like IT and marketing and healthcare, and these are big, large and you're actually trying to innovate that portfolio of spend. Who do we use? Who could we use smarter? Who could be the suppliers? Where could the ecosystem in? What if? So uh, that's, and you have to work at that for a number of years before you sort of move into areas like supply chain strategy, procurement strategy, heads of excellence. Um, so I think uh, a logistics MBA is super because it is using so many of your, uh, what I would call right and left hand mm -hmm. brain skills that it's a super exciting, you know, it's, it's numerical, it's analytic, it's art, it's science. Uh, I think it, it's, it's a, it's a great one. It's, it's it, logistics to me is like the procurement supply chain data and analytics side of things as well. It's, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, forward facing, uh, skill set to have yeah I, yeah that's i i would agree that be, between advances in data science and advances in kind of sensors and uh communications technology the the logistics background is going to be just it's going to be in a real hot zone of really exciting stuff and again it 
um, made all the more evident by what we've seen in the newspaper every day for the past three or four weeks. Another question that came in is, uh, and it's interesting, you and I have lived both sides of this. We have uh, spent much of our careers in service to the world's largest and most prominent organizations, and at the same time done that from smaller companies, entrepreneurial companies, you know, you know, they've grown to the point that they're they become significant. But we've been we've been this we've been in the small scrappy startup uh, phase as well. Roger asks, what advice would you give to small companies and entrepreneurs seeking to establish relationships with their own suppliers? And maybe on the other direction too. While we're at it, what would you give to small co companies and entrepreneurs looking to become suppliers to to major entities? Well, the the second part is absolutely. I mean, today. Uh, diverse supply chains is, is a mandate, particularly in the United States. You have to have uh, diverse supply chains. So I would say, first and foremost, uh, Roger, forget that you're small because uh, don't worry about being small. I think uh, there are suppliers out there who are attracted to companies that are easy to do business with. The big problem of doing business with larger organizations is the terms, the conditions, the contract. I, I loved it. Twitter's contract was, you know, 40 pages long. I'm like, what? You only allow me so many characters and your contract is this long? So that you, you know, I, I, there are a number of companies out there, MasterCard included, who spent a lot of time saying, our contracts need to be no more than two pages or three pages so that they're easily understandable. This is like buying a house, you know, the paperwork, the legality is so complicated, it throws a whole host of people out. Number two, actually work with them. Some very interesting companies are actually supporting smaller suppliers and newer suppliers to say, come in house. How can we support you through this process, whether that's in training or workshops or whatever, but even doing that allows companies to say, okay, this is going to be a really interesting partner for us because they want to support me to be successful. So I'm going to come to the table with, with ideas to invest in our joint success. So those would be two things that I would say. I would say take size out of the equation. Actually, just think about and and equally, we're seeing on the other side. You know, one of my favorites, like small company, unheard of in Singapore, Denova, the first to grow um, human to grow tissue scaffolding and artificial skin, so that they could completely disrupt the cosmetics market. And basically, you don't need to test um, cosmetics on animals anymore due to this company. Came out of nowhere. And, you know, the Estee Lauders and the L'Oreal's of the world were like, we've never heard of them. Like, they've come from nowhere. Wow. How do we, how did, you know, how do we miss this supplier? So that's, that's a really interesting, you know, uh, question. But I would say absolutely it's about really building those relationships and making, facilitating partnerships and, and business to be easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, I talked to a supplier once who said, you know, I've got a great idea. I'm eager to partner with someone to get it to market. Uh, and some the big guys may be too slow. And, and so they're, you know, for a smaller, you know, even just uh, even just ask them what's the best idea that you can't get into market right now sometimes really activates an interesting conversation. Um, we should, um, uh, this has been great. Uh, I, I've, I've got more questions, but I realize that we're the, we, we promised the audience we'd, uh, we'd get them back to their, uh, I guess, depending where they're morning, afternoon or evening. <laughs> um, so thank you for taking time to share your experience and thoughts. It's so great to catch up. Uh, special thanks to the audience for joining and asking questions. Uh, ask folks to follow DeVry on LinkedIn to be the first to hear about future digital dialogue events where myself and my colleagues talk with alums, business leaders across sectors and more. Uh, and of course, we'll uh, rebroadcast this will be available and we'll make sure that uh, we can we can keep spreading this word. There's so many great ideas in here. I can't wait to uh, I can't wait to continue the conversation uh, uh, in LinkedIn and beyond.